Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Campus Safety Voices. I'm Robin Hattersley, Editor-in-Chief of Campus Safety. With the rise of active shooter and active assailant attacks happening in our nation, more and more schools, institutions of higher education, and healthcare facilities are looking for better ways to keep intruders out, all while maintaining a welcoming environment for students, staff, patients, and guests. One of the most effective ways to do this is to fortify the glass windows and glass doors on campus. The question for protection professionals, however, is how to effectively accomplish this. Glass fortification is a complex issue that must be addressed with the help of a professional with years of experience protecting glass openings. That's why I spoke with Brad Campbell, president and founder of Riot Glass. Riot Glass is a manufacturer of retrofit retrofit security glazing systems designed to add a significant level of forced entry and or ballistic protection to any building. In our interview, Brad discusses how campuses can assess their glass openings and the various solutions that are currently available on the market. At the end of our interview, we'll watch a video that demonstrates how these various products work in both a test environment as well as in real life. For those of you in our audience who are listening to this podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you might want to watch the last 10 minutes of our interview either on CampusSafetyMagazine.com or on YouTube to see these products in action. So with that, here's my interview with Brad Campbell. Enjoy the show. Be sure to subscribe to Campus Safety's YouTube channel and like or leave a comment on our videos. Or subscribe to our Campus Safety Voices podcast on Apple and Spotify and leave a review. So Brad, why is it so important for glass openings such as windows and doors to be fortified? And won't just installing locks do the job of keeping intruders and active assailants out? I'm really glad you asked that question. That's really the basis of our entire existence. We're here to educate everyone about the importance of fortifying your windows and glass doors because there's some misnomers out there about security and how to properly secure a building. Um, you know, cameras and access controls, locks, and, and all of that is an extremely important aspect of any building security profile. But what, what can happen is all that can be bypassed simply by forcing your way through the glass. We see a lot of, um, see a lot of videos and demonstrations where someone's trying to breach a window that has, you know, window film or laminated glass on it. And they're trying to get an entire 300 pound or 275 pound law enforcement with uh, body armor through the window to show that it's a breach. And that's really not the way it happens in, in real life. Statistically, in most cases, someone just needs to be able to get their hand through the window to manipulate the mortise lock or the panic egress hardware. So we're kind of on a mission to make sure that people understand when you're shopping for security, we need to fortify the building so that they can't just bypass all of the other expensive electronics and everything that you have. I think all of those things are an incredibly important part of any security profile upgrade on a building, cameras, access controls, um, any, any type of uh, pre-warning system that we have, whether it's gunshot sensors or, um, you know, uh, AI and cameras that can pick up on cars that are recognized as a potential disgruntled uh, parent or something of that nature. But all of that will be for naught if an intruder can get into the building very quickly. So by fortifying the glass, you are delaying their ability to get into the building. And we'll talk about that as we go a little bit more in detail, some of the different aspects of uh, how to sort of make that assessment as to what you would need in what area. But all too often, uh, the, the wrong solution is put on the wrong type of glass and people feel that their building is protected and their building is absolutely not protected. So what type of assessment process do you recommend so campuses adopt the right solution or solutions for their facilities? It's definitely not a one size fits all um, product. And that's often what, what we find is that there's an initiative put out for uh, putting a laminate on or changing the glass out for laminated glass. And the first thing we need to do is a detailed threat assessment on the building. And there's a lot of different uh, components that should be considered, not only just the threat level, but if we're going to touch the glazing, 
to upgrade the security profile, we should really be looking at all of the other potential problems that we could also solve while we're in the process of doing that. For one example, if we're going to fortify the glass, we may also want to add um, some tint to whatever we're retrofitting onto the windows for security, for uh, privacy, so that an intruder walking in on campus cannot look in and easily identify which rooms are, are full of students, um, if there's a security guard inside the main entrance. That's just one example. Uh, mitigating incoming glare and heat can also be a consideration when you're choosing to upgrade your glazing. My background is in window film for 30 years. We're running one of the largest 3M window film dealerships out in Los Angeles. We realized, though, that as we did more and more security assessments, that there was something missing between basic laminated glass and window films, which are you know, considered on the lower end of the protection scale, and the very high-end ballistic glazing. And in between, there's not a lot that can be retrofitted that's lightweight, that doesn't require you to change your hinges and all of your uh, door hardware. Something that can be put right on your existing windows and glass doors that's lightweight, but is a formidable barrier to entry. Not just a two to three second, as you'll see. Um, and at the end, we're going to roll a video and I'm going to kind of talk through. So a lot of what I'm saying here will, will make sense in context as we watch that, that quick video. Um, but you'll see how quickly regular laminated glass and window films on tempered glass in a door can be thwarted. And I think that uh, we all should just take a step back and really consider what it is that we're trying to accomplish so that we don't just check the box. And then when an incident actually happens, someone just quickly gets into the building. Because an intruder coming onto the campuses is, is a, it's a terrible thing, right? Things are going definitely not in our direction when that happens. But what's much worse than that is that they can actually get into the building. At that point, we have real trouble on our hands. We need time. We need time to react. Um, if if the school's uh, staff and students have been trained, uh, there's multiple different protocols out there for what to do in an incident like that. Let's assume that whether they are trained or not trained, if they're not trained, they really need a lot of time to, to pull it together and figure out what's going on and, and make a move. Uh, if they are trained, they can do that much more quickly. But in any case, they need more than one to two to three seconds. So we do an enormous amount of testing at Riot Glass, both in the back lot. So we'll go out to Rahagi's or your local shooting range and we'll test all our products there, as well as in the laboratory to see what these products will actually do when a determined intruder is trying to get through them. And I think this is absolute crucial information. So I'm so glad your audience has joined us today because um, we need this background. We need to understand that in certain areas of the building, you need stronger protection than others. And that top-down assessment is something that, that we do all the time. I mean, some schools are made, you know, you'll, you'll, they're small. Their original school footprint is small. And they've added on buildings, mobile units, um, room additions, a whole wing. So multiple different construction uh, times, you know, age, age of building, different construction uh, products, different glazing, different glazing type, different code was used on different types of glass. So it's absolutely crucial that a security professional that's familiar with glazing specific uh, security protocols reviews to make sure we know what type of glass we have. Is it tempered? Is it annealed? Is it is there already a laminate in there? Um, what is the what is the anticipated threat level? Are we looking at force entry, bullet resistance, blast, human impact, vandalism, storm, earthquake? All these are really important considerations. And if you don't know the answers to those, uh, we can help you walk through those uh, considerations. And then while we're doing that, we'll also look at heat load, tenant comfort, all those different things so that we really specifically dial this in. And one of the things that's a bonus to doing it, taking that approach is that there can be an ROI, not only from peace of mind and securing the building, but an energy reduction. And, ten, and occupant comfort, which affects the circadian rhythm and a student's ability to learn. Um, we can improve that while we're working on the glazing already. And why not? You know, you kill two birds with one stone and, um, you know, dramatically improve the security profile as well as energy efficiency and, and tenant comfort. That's the way we should do it. And one thing that a lot of people ask me is that sounds really complex. You've got multiple glass types of so multiple recommendations based on that multiple recommendations based on the anticipated threat level and the area of the building and where, where it's most likely to, you know, intruder to enter. 
And, you know, maybe we'll put ballistic in one area and force entry in another, and we can get away with window film here, but we want bright glass, armor blast here. How do we possibly get through the complexities of that? And my answer is often that we, we have a very specific protocol for doing this, and we use checklists. So just like any complex endeavor that human beings will go through, whether you consider like an airline pilot flying a very complex piece of machinery, the only way we can do that repeatedly over and over, thousands and thousands of flights in the sky every single day, and considering the number of flights, the accidents are so few, how do we do that? It's such a complex process, whether that we're talking about a mechanical aspect of repairing planes or the act of getting pilots to fly them. We do that through a very comprehensive, regimented checklist protocol. And that's the way that we do it at Right Glass, so that we make sure that all the all the questions were asked and all the boxes are checked. And when we do that, it's not that difficult. We just need that we just need people to understand that are looking, seeking to fortify their building that this is it is possible to do it correctly. And and please, please take the time to contact a qualified glazing consultant, security consultant, to make sure you get this right because. A lot of standard security consultants do not understand glazing. They're incredibly adept at all different perimeter security and all that um, former law enforcement, military, much respect, but they don't know glass that well. And that's where we come in. So they can lean on us and we can help them make sure that they get it right. So what are the different types of glass protection solutions currently available in the market? You know, which ones are most effective for like preventing forced entry versus like um, se severe weather earthquakes, bomb blasts? Um, and what are what solutions are most appropriate for like energy savings? I'm sure they're all different or are they the same? No, they're 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 vastly different, which is where the complexities come in. We consider all this in our security assessments. You know, these are all the questions. Those are great questions. I mean, because all that needs to be determined. Um, we'll look for things like the, the standoff for a, uh, a, you know, the street and parking lot, for example, can't see through my windows here. We have a street right there. So there's other, other parts of the security profile upgrade that would be taken into consideration there. Perhaps bomb blast mitigation would be a good solution here if cars are allowed to park right there. There should also, you know, maybe consider bollards to prevent vehicle entry. Um, but on the other side of the building, near the soccer field, where there's no way to drive a vehicle in there, we probably don't need to worry about bomb blast mitigation. And a lot of products can cross over. In other words, we can, you know, we can put a solution on that sort of checks all, more than just one box. Uh, but we do ask all those questions. Um, in some cases, it's just vandalism, or maybe we're near the maybe we're near the basketball court and the balls keep hitting the windows and breaking them, or it could be vandalism. Maybe there's an adjacent homeless encampment or some kids in that particular neighborhood that are throwing rocks all the time, BB guns. Those are vastly different. That's what we call the vandalism category. The basic categories for penetration security are force entry, bullet resistance, vandalism, bomb blast mitigation, human impact, which is someone tripping and falling into the glass, or um, storm, an earthquake. And a lot of those are sort of hybrid solutions that can cover more, um, more check boxes than just one. I think if we had a perfect world, everyone would just put really heavily, heavily armored glass in your building. I and mean, why not? If we could afford it, and you, it looks the same, it looks normal, why wouldn't we just put heavily fortified, you know, UL level eight ballistic glass in our buildings? And the answer is simple. I mean, it's just cost. It just doesn't make sense to do that. It's too heavy. It's too expensive to and onerous to, to do a retrofit like that. So we really want to make sure that we're assessing the budget too. That's such a huge part of this. So we really want to get to the areas of the building where an intruder will be most likely to enter. Usually it's right through the front doors. I mean, we've got perimeter fencing and landscaping and other things that are deterrents to someone walking around the back of the building. They're more likely just to walk right in the front door down the main sidewalk. Those areas are probably statistically the most likely. You, you never really know exactly what an intruder is going to attempt to do but we kind of have to look at statistical data. And if we're gonna armor up somewhere, you know, the entrances are for sure uh, somewhere that needs a lot of attention. So a lot of schools and, and campuses of all types will consider their main high traffic areas. At a hospital, it may be an emergency room entrance. 
or, or the main entrance to the hospital. Uh, at schools, it's definitely the main the main entrance, and um, you know all the secondary entrances usually will have glass adjacent to a door. So we have a big threat there, and that that adjacent glass will almost always be tempered glass. So temper breaks into tiny cubes, or annealed breaks into big shards. So annealed can't be near an entrance because that's too dangerous for human impact. So if it's a newer school uh, that's you know recent code, it's going to be tempered. Tempered is great for safety. No one ever has an arterial bleed from tempered glass. It's like little pebbles, but annealed glass is very dangerous if someone impacts it. So generally, you're going to find annealed glass on the classroom windows that are over behind the bushes. They're three or four feet above grade, and those by code can be annealed. They're very unlikely that anyone will run into those windows. So though window film is incredibly effective on annealed glass. And we've done tons of uh, tests. If you go to our YouTube channel, Rye Glass YouTube channel, you'll see demonstrations where we'll, we have these wooden bucks with different types of glass repeated. So annealed tempered, annealed tempered, annealed tempered, and each one has a different solution on it so that we can demonstrate live and in person to different school districts or personnel, law enforcement, how the how that window will react. So it could be the exact same window, the same solution, different glass type, and you get a dramatically different outcome. So tempered glass is not a very stable solution once it's been broken. It becomes completely destabilized. It's like a bag of gravel. So if you put window film on there, it can be punctured in seconds. And, and we demonstrate that on our other YouTube channel videos all the time. So on the most vulnerable areas, we may want to consider ballistic resistance, bullet, bullet resistant uh, solution, and or a uh, axis denial solution, which is a polycarbonate overglazing or glazing replacement solution, which is essentially impossible to get through. If someone shoots, for example, into a door and it's riddled with bullets and they still can't puncture a hole to get their hand in, uh, that's better than, I mean, that's, it's not as good as having a level eight thick ballistic glass that stops the bullets, but at least even if they are firing bullets through, everyone's going to run. So their target acquisition possibilities are incredibly limited because they're stuck outside and everyone's taken off and, and going to run, run and hide, call 911, evacuate the building, do other measures. We want to make sure that even in those conditions, they cannot get their hand through. So you only need a contraband breach, which is about the size of my fist get your hand in and all, all schools are gonna have panic egress hardware that all you have to do is get in and pull that. And you'll see that in our video coming up here and you're in the building in seconds. I think we are 5.2 seconds on a security laminated glass that we're able to shoot uh, a couple of holes in it and puncture through and we're in the building. Whereas a uh, armor plast access to now glazing, you're, you're, you're not getting in. Even if you've shot multiple holes, you're not getting through that door. So all of that needs to come into play in the assessment. Sorry to be a little long-winded on that answer, but um, yeah, there's lots of different, lots of different uh, security options for different entry areas of the building, potential entry areas. So, you know, Brad, there's a lot of attention on active assailants right now. So can you explain in more detail and, and really break down in detail the specific solutions to address this threat and how a campus can most effectively protect its glass openings from active assailants and other types of intruders? Yeah, as I stated earlier, it's really important for everyone involved to understand the type of glass that they have and where the most um, vulnerable areas of the building are. And we want to walk them through that so that they feel very comfortable and assured that they're making a good choice. And it's oftentimes highly variable. We'll have one solution on one part of the building, another maybe not, not as robust solution on another part of the building, and even maybe a lower level security on another building. We'll still cover all the glass. So as I said earlier, we don't know exactly where an assailant's going to choose to enter the building or how they're going to choose to enter. But, you know, we have statistical likelihoods that we work with and, you know, we want to fortify the areas where, where they're most vulnerable and where the threat would be um, uh, the biggest challenge for us. So I'd like everyone to just kind of think about this and there, there needs to be a paradigm shift in the way that we think about glass security for our buildings. Um, I'll give you a case study as an example. There was a fire in 1958 in, uh, in Chicago at a school called Our Lady of Angels. You can Google it, 1958. We, we had fire code at that time. We had 
some other incidents that had uh, led to fire escapes on a lot of buildings, not all. We did have fire code, uh, but they were, I would say, loosely enforced. Uh, there was no real broad code, universal code uh, to comply to, especially in terms of construction and retrofits. That, that fire really left a huge impact. There was an uh, award-winning photo on the cover of Time magazine of a firefighter carrying a deceased 10 year old boy out of that building. And that went like a lightning bolt through society. And it fundamentally changed the way that we think about fire codes in our buildings. Today, we've got wider stairways, multiple different stairways, because in that fire, the stairway was blocked. They couldn't get everyone out. The ladders weren't tall enough. The fire department couldn't find the building, one thing after another, and there were a lot of casualties. So with fire retard and everything, sprinkler systems, wider hallways, wider doors, uh, fire rated doors and glazing. Um, and we don't have very many casualties in buildings as a result of fire anymore. But what, what do we have problems with in our schools? As you stated in your question, we've got active assailants that are a big concern for everyone. So my mission is to encourage people to think differently about glass. Regular glass, is for a polite society that we don't have currently. We need to fortify our openings to make sure that if someone decides randomly to try and enter a building, that they're not going to be able to do that in seconds. It's not going to be easy for them. And part of that though, is just like with fire code, we need to make sure that we think this through very well thought out. With fire codes, we've got fire egress, we've got certain types of glass. There's a lot that goes into it. And we want to be on the forefront and the cutting edge of helping people adapt their schools, just like with fire codes, to have essentially active threat mitigating properties in place at the most uh, crucial times and places in the building. And it's not a difficult thing to do. Riot Glass is all about riot, uh, retrofit, lightweight, affordable, incredibly effective solutions. And we just need people to to adopt this policy and, um, and we will see a significant decrease in these incidences. Thank you, Brad. Uh, we're now gonna switch over because we've got a whole, some really good video from you guys. And so I'm gonna switch it over right now. So this is the video from you guys. Yeah, and this is, we'll start with force intro. I'm kind of go through different actual surveillance videos of bad guys trying to get through riot class and also some live test video from the laboratory. In this particular case, this was the 2020 riots in Los Angeles. The police were standing down. They were not chasing anybody. These guys had all the time in the world. This is a very high-end retailer with $25,000 shoes in there. And they've got a parking uh, block there. You can see a parking stop made out of concrete that they were using as a battering ram. And they're just not able to get through. And you can see that the video is taken from someone apparently they know inside a car which was very unusual for us to get a video like that. And this is one of those tests we told you about earlier where we'll, we'll take a standard storefront door and retrofit it with ride glass. And there's an, our BR version for doors. And here's a standard laminated glass. And you can see that that security glass does not stop bullets, nor does it stop an intruder. Here you can see with a, a typical crowbar, that was 5.24 seconds. and I was able to reach through and open that panicky rest hall. So five seconds is not enough time. Time buys options. We need more time. So that's really what right glass is, is it's an unbreakable lightweight glass that looks just like regular glass. And you can see after well over a minute, we just give up because you're not going to get through. So that's a, that's a controlled test environment. This is an actual C store. We call it convenience store attack down in Texas. And this is a, the guy's got a sledgehammer for those of you that don't have a video and are listening. He's got a sledgehammer and he's hitting this door. Now it's an overglaze. So we call this the invisible board up. It goes right over your existing glass. So because he's hitting it over and over and over again with a sledgehammer, he does break the glass, but he's still not able to get through. And you can see he's questioning whether or not he should even try. He goes back again and hits it another three times with full swing and the wind up and everything. And he is just not going to be able to get into that store. So the next day, this is what they find, just some marked up uh, panels. They swept up, no board up, and they were back in business the next day. And this is some live, uh, this is some laboratory testing. These are 7.62 rounds, the kind of ammunition using AK-47. 
Now they are going through the door. This is Armor Class AP25 overglazing right over an existing tempered glass door. And they're shooting it from straight on and at various obliquities, just to show that even though this door is riddled with bullets, um, the intruder, the lab technicians in this case, throwing bricks at it, kicking it, smashing it with all manner of tools are not going to be able to get through this door. So this test actually goes on for well over eight minutes and they're using everything from two by fours to wrenches, all, all different types of um, claw hammers, bats. And in the end, the test finishes with a sledgehammer um, until it's breached, but, or until the technician is unable to continue. So you'll see as he picks up the actual sledgehammer, the glass falls away. That glass has film on it too, but the uh, access denial panel is in front of that. So even though he's hitting it with a sledgehammer, um, he is just unable to get through and gives up. So there's really nothing else in the market that's going to perform at that level at this price point. So it's the lightest weight, strongest material. Now this is what we call, it's an AST, ASTM test of the panel only. And you can see they've got it in a steel bucket. It's pulled as tight as a drum and they're hitting it with uh, sledgehammers plus all different types of steel and metal devices to, to show how to you know, increase the impact in a very small area of that over and over again. And he's freezing it now with a fire extinguisher. That's, that was actually five minutes sped up. And now in its frigid, freezing cold condition, he's going to hit it with a sledgehammer. We get a lot of people ask about that. If we're in a really cold weather area, will that diminish the strength? So we test it accordingly. It does not diminish the strength. Of course, they're burning with a butane torch there. And still cannot get, still cannot get that contraband breach. Um, this is a bullet resistant uh, portion. Now this is a common test. We do these, this particular one was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you can see the law enforcement there have shot that window multiple times. There's no whiteout conditions. There's no spidering. There's no way to breach that with a heavy tool and the bullets did not go through. You can see the bullets wedged in the panel. And this is uh, one of our, uh, this is called our uh, ride glass level four. This is designed for distance threats um, against a weapon like a 30 out six, 30 caliber, you know, deer hunting rifle. Um, and this was this particular opening, uh, we needed to put a, a shelf underneath it to set our system on because the landlord would not let the tenant uh, put anything into the existing window. So we had to build it in front of the window. And this is the actual glass that we used. And you can see that we're really giving that the treatment. And that glass flying in, that's not the bullet going through. That's actually spall. We call it spall. It's the glass that flies off from the kinetic energy. And in a makeup like this, this is a level eight insulating glass unit. If we want to eliminate spall, we can. We just put the, what we call a no spall coating, a polycarbonate coating on the inside of that build, on the inside of that glass. And you can see here, I'm going to show you, this is a level eight. And you can see that spall coming off the back of the window, that plume of glass, but there's no hole. So it's not putting a hole in, but that spall is coming off right there. You see that? Now that could, that could cause injury. So we can put a coating on the inside right there. It's polycarbonate or window film on the inside of that ballistic makeup to knock the spall down. Or, and some people want to put a heat, heat strengthened piece of glass on the back because they don't want anybody to be able to scratch the polycarbonate. And the polycarbonates have an abrasion resistant and UV coating on them. They're incredibly tough. They're like glass-like hardness but some people want to put the uh, spall coat on the back anyway. Now this is vandalism. These kids are throwing rocks. This is actual surveillance video of kids trying to break into a convenience store shell gas station. And they, you can see all the different impact points and there was no, no entry. A little bit of damage to the frame, but they didn't even break the glass. Now this is a bomb blast test. This is what we call a shock tube simulates an actual live blast. There is a pressure chamber there, and then a diaphragm right there goes into the apparatus right there and is bolted in. There's a thermite charge that blows the uh, diaphragm and releases the pressure through. It's just like a blast. It goes through that tunnel into the glass. So that's how we test for that. 
And a hurricane is a uh, large missile impact. We're shooting a two by four out of an air cannon. And that is hitting the AP25 system that is over the front of the existing glazing and the glass does not break. That two by four is about nine pounds going about 50, 50 miles an hour out of that cannon. And then the more brutal side of the test is this um, cycling test. There's a, like a vacuum type apparatus that hooks up to the back of that and it pulls and pushes and pulls to simulate the, uh, the pressure differential in a, in a storm. And this is human impact. So that's a 200 pound bag that, that emulates someone falling into the glass. So all of that testing is done so that when our clients get that product, they have the test reports, they understand exactly what that system is rated to do and what it's not rated to do. And so that's you know the educational process that goes into a very difficult task of right-sizing your security glazing profile. Uh, but that's what we're here for is that we take over that consulting arm uh, aspect of the, the process and work with your security consultant or your uh, school security uh, safety officers, security officers. And uh, you know we're able to do that time and time again using this methodology. Beth, thank you so much. Where can folks find you guys online? We're at riotglass.com. And you can go there and peruse. The best way to do it, though, is just to fill out the form or give us a call and we will walk you through the process. It is quite complex, but that's what we're here for. So we'd love to help you also check us out online. YouTube channel is a great way to educate yourself at Riot Glass, uh, at Riot Glass on YouTube. And uh, don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you guys there on the next video. Thanks, Brad.